based on an entirely different kind of architecture, which I described earlier as a meaning module. And the way that a meaning module works, I'm going to articulate real quickly, <laughs> um, is like this. We talked about the course outliner, which identifies the modules and their relationships in what we call course space. The reference tool palette I showed you briefly. The process of attribution, which includes saying what kind of gross freeway or gross modality, what kind of specific representational bias. And these are unlimited. These are just all placeholders right now for the flavor of what I'm talking about. What kind of mediation, what kind of content, what kind of difficulty all of which create this word, this mathematical word, so that a representation might be viewed as the representation's actual content, whether it's a multimedia object or series of objects or a body of text, the representation's attribute or word, the list of references that, in other words, the words in here that an author has created references for, by their reference type, for, for example, being biographical and nine, for example, being encyclopedic. So list of references, list of re references that are actually in, list of references that are being requested. That works with a process that I can't explain and articulate in any great length, but we simply call vocabulary threshold detection, that in addition to the references that we allow an author to create, when he requests or request, the system is going to take, let's say you just wrote something that was intended for fifth or sixth graders. We would take a third grade minimum proficiency reading list and screen every word you use. And make that distill out into an additional reference request list in addition to the things you intentionally or specifically requested. Those lists are then merged and everything you haven't created a reference for becomes dispatched to um, what we're going to call a reference server which deals with doing the index translations between your requests and what's available currently in CD-ROM or the electronic libraries to support them. <clears throat> Those references are sorted by type and, an, and a secondary process of editing or creating references enabled at the authoring level, whereby references or biographical references, things are sorted into their, their various qualities, reference qualities. They can be edited or created and context can be checked in case somebody's lost as to what the meaning was. So that the next stage looks like, there's our mathematical word, there's the content, the bulk representation content, there's the list of things within this that get references, and here are the actual references in little containers, isolating them in terms of their reference types. Now this is what it looks like for one representation. If you fuse all these together, and summarize all of the mathematical language up into the modules header, fuse them together, and distribute the redundancy of references to the tail, in other words, everything that occurs more than once, you displace into the back, into the further and further out into the system, then you end up with what we call a meaning module, which looks like this. It has very little overhead because none of its structure exists unless you create the structure to accommodate a different representation or a different class of reference. But the way the system works enables us to make a course so that a course is really a series of modules like this which deal with specific meaning intentions or learning objectives which are related by links, which we'll call implication or explication links between the modules. So there is no course. There is no big database in the normal sense. There's a series of these meaning modules that have these loop-like relations between them that inside the meaning module, all of the power for the dexterity of support is in the structure or architecture of the data, data file itself. Now, so at any given time, the learner is in the center of a bubble that consists of arguably many of these that they can change navigationally, that at any time they can look into the various reference supports, they can adjust the compass or bias settings on, they can jump into gross alternative representations or more specific representations, or they can jump to outside things in the world. To show you this functionally, This is a, a view for techies only. Um, 
This is the inside of a meaning module being displayed in HyperCard. These are discrete cavities. Notice that right now the only thing that's in there is a central thread, and that's what we're seeing here. So let's say that, that, that we're a learner. Let me simulate the learner from this point of view so you understand how efficient this can be technologically. If I look at the word gravity, or this is one and nine, one meaning a dictionary, nine meaning an encyclopedia. So if I was to, on the learner interface, look up gravity, then immediately it would check this list and throw up the icons one and nine, dictionary encyclopedia, no delay. It's not going out into the world to try to figure it out. It's right there, it's a simple list. It's, a, it's in RAM already. Well, when I pull up the dictionary, when it says that, here's the dictionary. And this is just the dictionary that supports this meaning module. So I only have a few things to look through, even though I'm doing it brute force, to grab just what I want and bring it back to you. I'm not having to look through the universe. I'm not having to make a system transaction, if you will. Same thing with the encyclopedia. The point is distributed processing. So that... It, that if you were to look at this in a traditional model, everything that the learner is doing could be causing a transaction load on the network, could be causing a transaction hit to access CD-ROM. The way that our system is designed is only the large bulk contents, like a big picture or a big sound, is requiring a discrete load to the outside world. Everything else is forming as a bubble around the learner as they move with these qualities so that the learner's relationship is always inside of RAM. It's always at RAM speed to all of these various lists and what have you. So there is no delay in the sense that we would normally associate with HyperCard with normal types of search engine processes. And the benefit of that is that yes, it will take so much power, so much time to execute a such and such image or such and such simulation. But in terms of providing the choices, operating on text, simple graphics, and the basic design of this relationship, it could run on the most low-powered machines you can imagine. It could run on Apple IIs, and it could run on Nintendo machines. So the difference becomes, when I'm on a 2CI, I've still got the same relationship, the same quality of dance with the learning experience, but now I've got it with enormously powerful and, and elaborate environments. But when I'm at home with my Nintendo game, or I'm in a lab with a bunch of Mac Classics working on a very slow speed Apple Talk network, I've got the same basic relationship process. And all of that's helping me learn to become a better subject master at the same time, and more importantly, it's helping me learn to articulate and become uh, more fluent with my own learning needs. So, now we could go on for another six or seven hours, but this is the basics of it. and. Uh, would like to say before we have to get out of here that if there's any questions or anything we might be more mutually engaging on, I'd certainly appreciate the opportunity to do that. Yes? The reference earlier really when you were being introduced that you'd worked with the school system. Yeah. In the classroom? Um, my experience is in the classroom. But Except for people who get interested. But my question was what the kids do, what the teachers do. First of all, this, this is not actually running in classrooms right now. Yeah. This is a, uh, a philosophy of vision and a technical articulation of how to manifest that. What would the vision be of what they would do then? Um, that this would be the way that all of the computers that might be in any classroom would allow them to relate to mean the meaning and information about anything. And that it would all flow back to the teacher through a summarizing you know, snapshot like I described that would let them know in a distributed fashion the difficulties their learners are encountering in whatever information space they've been in. Teacher is monitoring for the most part. The teacher is getting a summary, okay, which could be morning or could be afternoon, or if it was a computer laboratory, a full lab, then yeah, it could be a dynamic monitoring. 